Henry Greenbaum, Auschwitz concentration camp, the Holocaust, World War II. Henry is one of my Holocaust survivors whom I interviewed in the Maryland area, in the Bethesda, Maryland area about 15 years ago. I interviewed Henry, it was December 6, 2008, Silver Spring, Maryland. He's one of the first Holocaust survivors I interviewed and what a story he tells. He showed me the tattoo marking of his number from Auschwitz and just told a tremendous story. One of my most gripping stories and I ran from the Holocaust for a lot of years. I didn't want to hear about it but you know what? It's something we need to hear at least once and I invite you to watch my film Yom HaShoah, The Holocaust Remembered. It's on my YouTube channel here. But Henry's just a great man. He, he was 80 years old when I interviewed him and just very spry and just gave me a whole bunch of pictures that I'll show you after this introduction. And, um, but I'm just, my heart's full. I just really am thankful for this story. Chris Jansen, thank you, sir, for continuing to support my work and making it possible for my viewers to watch Henry's story. I pull it out of my archives. It's been in there 15 years, but he's also featured in my Holocaust film. So I, I, I'm going to have to see if he's still with us. I hope he is. He'd be 95 years old today. But Chris, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for your support of our veterans and the work that I'm doing. It means the world to me. I, I salute you, sir. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a video, it's easy. Just click on the link in the video description or go to my website, LarryCapato.com. If you'd like to donate to this work, it, there's a, a link in the comment section at the top of the comments. So, amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching and listening to my Voices of History radio station and this YouTube video channel. It just, it's just a blessing. So, so many stories, so much work to be done. Oh my goodness, if you could see behind the scenes what goes in to making these videos and making them available to you. But it's a labor of love. I thank God I'm serving my God and my country through the lens of my camera all these years, 20 years now plus. God bless you. Like I said, thank you for sharing the videos and subscribing to the channel. And tell somebody else about this great work that's going on here. We need to remember. If we don't remember, we're going to forget. Amen. Okay, Henry, tell me again where you were born. In Poland. What year was that? April 1st, 1928. 1928. So yes. you are 80 years old. I'm 80 years old. Okay. April, you, I was 80. Just just a, a quick little history of your family, brothers, sisters, your mom and well, dad. Okay. I come from a family of nine children, six girls and three guys, my mom and dad. That's a lot of kids. That's right. But we had three married sisters, so they didn't live with us for, for, at the end. Now, wh where were you living before the war? In the same city? In the same city called Starachowice. Okay. And we're, we're going to probably jump around a little bit about that, the story. That's okay. What, what I'd like to talk about is you as a young child, and of course, uh, 
leading up to the war, the war, World War II, and then how you and your family were were taken by the Germans or what happened. So just t what kind of childhood did you have? Did you grow up like a normal child? I had no normal upbringing. We were orthodox at home. I went through Hebrew school. I went through uh, uh, public school. We played soccer with Jewish kids against non-Jewish kids. You know, we got along with our kids, with neighbors. We had no problem. A normal upbringing. We were in the tailoring business. Now, how far were you from Germany at that? How far was... That I don't know. The distance between my... That I don't know. Okay. It's good where the border lines were. That I don't know. But, okay, so you grew up as a child. And, uh, a normal upbringing. We had, you know, like a child does. We had games we played and... He, we had school to do, you had homework to do, just a normal upbringing. Yeah. There's some chores you had to do in the house, too. Yeah. Well, okay, so you're born in 1928. At, at, what, at what time did things start getting rough for you and for your family, and eventually, I'm assuming, you were taken out of your home, right? Well, the, we had, like I say, everything was fine until one day we heard that they, they're not too far away from us, from my city. And my, my father died two months before the war. So my mom was protective, and she got a horse and buggy and took us over to a farmer that we knew, and he put us up for three days until the bombing subsided in the city. When they take over our city, they usually blow bombs. We, not, we weren't too far from the railroad station. My mom was worried that we maybe get hurt that way. So we went away for three days. They stayed in the farm until they took over our city. I think it was September of uh, 39. Now, what, what country are you in again? Poland. Oh, okay. So the Germans have already started taking over countries. And Did you know who Adolf Hitler was at that time? No, I personally did, did, did not know. No, I was too young. I did not know it. But you didn't know this man that was crazy? Crazy, no. No, I did not. My parents, I'm sure, knew. Yeah. But my mom was always saying, it's not going to It's not going to happen. No, no use running away. Uh, she always said that she remembers from World War I. They take over our city. They might be a little bit unkind to you, but they won't do no killing. But she was wrong. So you had, you had eight brothers and sisters? No, I had three brothers. Oh, I'm sorry. Two brothers and I. So it's three guys and six girls. Well, so, I mean, there's nine of you. Nine of you so total. There's, there's eight besides yourself. Correct. Nine total, yeah, okay. So are you the youngest? Or the youngest? I was the youngest child, yes. Oh, I was the baby. Mm -hmm. So this, Henry, just start telling me a little bit about your knowledge of, you know, you're thinking that they're going to come and take your city, the Germans. I mean, as a young child, is there a lot of anxiety? Are you fearful? Or does your mother and dad reassure you that you'll be fine? My mother did say that we were fine, but we just had to leave the city so no one gets hurt over until they take over the city. But other than that, I didn't worry them too much. I was not aware of all this brutality that they're going to continue to do. We didn't know that. No one did, I don't think. So would you guys say prayers every day? I mean, how Oh, yeah, we went, we went to synagogue every day. My father, uh, we lived a few doors from the synagogue. We went twice a day. Was there a prayer of safety for everybody? I mean, how would you pray about that? Well, we have certain prayers that you do. Of course, don't ask me. I wouldn't know the prayers. But there's prayers for that, yet. So God will protect you. So t tell me about when the Germans came in and how you remember, did they take your whole family out or what happened? Well, this is what happened. We were back to our city after the bombing subsided and they took over the city. Within a couple of weeks, they put us on the Yellow Star of David, back in front. We had to be identified by that. I already looked Jewish anyway because I had the curls here and I had the tassel sticking out. I was Jewish looking anyway, but they want to make sure. So they put us on the Yellow Star of David. We did that. I went to school, public school. The teacher sent us home. No school for Jews because we already were marked. So that was it. And then after that, we could no longer go to school. You could no longer go to the park. You couldn't go to any movies. You could not leave town. You, you put, stay put. And when you say you were marked, was there a physical mark? No, no, just a patch. Okay. Just a yellow patch. And who did that? The, the Germans? The Germans, yeah. 
They, and why, why did, why, you probably didn't understand that. Did no, you? I didn't because I was already Jewish. But they, they wanted to have it on. They wanted to make sure not everybody had their curls and, you know, not orthodox. You have some are and some are not. But nevertheless, they're still Jewish. So, and once they put the Star of David on you, and if you walked on the sidewalk, and any soldier that come face to face, you had to step off the sidewalk, take your head off, which we were never, never bareheaded, and we had to stay attention until the soldier, any, any rank, whoever he was, you had to stop, get off the sidewalk and let him walk through. And I got so bad that you were jumping up on the sidewalk and onto the road, on the sidewalk, because they kept coming through all the time. So we stopped walking the street. We stayed strictly inside. Did you have any interaction with these German soldiers? Were they nice to you? Were they mean to you? I never had any interaction with them. I don't think they didn't look that they were nice. I mean, they looked nice when you look at them, yes. But they were nothing later. You found out they were cold-blooded murders. You know. So, so and, at what point... Did you find yourself being taken away, or did they take all the family away? To a well, camp? for a while we stayed, but until 1940, we were still in our homes. Actually, our home was still in the area. Most of our Jewish people in our town lived near the synagogue because of the Sabbath. You're not supposed to ride on the Sabbath to the synagogue. You're supposed to be walking distance. So most of us lived near the synagogue, like you have in America. You have an Irish neighborhood. A, a, a Catholic neighborhood. We had a Jewish neighborhood right near our synagogue. So what they did, they barbed wire, three block perimeter with five foot barbed wire, not a fence, just piled up uh, five foot high all around with an opening. And most of us were in there. They could, you could not no longer get out of there because they had the two guards right there and everybody was there. The ones that lived to the outskirts of the town, they went to the Jew, they went to the uh, city police and to show them where the Jews, the rest of the Jews live. And they only gave them a few minutes to grab what they can and they put them into the same area. So it became what we say a ghetto. So that was the, all the Jews were right there. So we stayed in the ghetto till October of 42. For two years we stayed there. And we all walk, worked uh, in the factories. Most of us had jobs working for the ammunition factory because the rumors came around from other towns but you, if you had a job in the factory, it might be better for you. They didn't care if you're a shoemaker or, or a tailor or carpenter making. They didn't care that. But if you work for the government, they liked that. My father was still alive that time, and one of our customers happened to be a manager in the munition factories. He gave us jobs, gave myself a job. I was almost 12. And then my three sisters, we worked in the munition factory. And we stayed in this ghetto until October 42. October 42, they decided they're going to have a selection because they didn't want to feed everybody in the ghetto. You had, everyone was in the ghetto. You had pregnant women. You had uh, disabled people. You had people who just, women who just gave birth to children. Elderly people. They had us all se segregated, separated us. Selection. You walked up with the family and in two minutes, your family is separated. My sisters, two sisters had children with them under the age of 10. They told them to go to the same place where my mom went. She was only 54, but she was considered old, I guess. And then they separated them. At the end of the day, only thing was left was the workforce, able bodies. We no longer saw them. We didn't know where they took them or where. We found out after the war that they took them to Treblinka, and that was nothing but a killing factory. I wasn't there, I didn't know how they did it, but I'm sure they lied to them. They coaxed them in, they said shower. Everybody wants to take a shower. Once you're in the shower, instead of water, you get the cyclone gas. In 15 minutes, you, you're dead. That's what we were told that they did. I didn't see that, but that's how. All I know is they're not here. And I was only left with my three sisters to work because we already had jobs in the factory. We marched out of the pace and we came through, uh, chased us for six kilometers uphill and they built for us a slave labor camp on top of a stone quarry. We were not aware of it. We never went up there on the outskirts of the town on top of the stone quarry. 
six foot fences, double fences, two towers, and of course the guards with their dogs. And by the time we got up there, they had it all in German, Achtung, attention. You have to empty all your pockets, all your belongings, all your valuables. There was a box sitting standing next to it, and they had to empty their pockets. They told you if you come through the gate and they catch anything on your valuable, you'll be killed. So everybody, necklaces, watches, I didn't have anything, but my sisters did. They took off and they had to put it in the box with them. We came through in there, and that's the first time I got introduced to a barrack. I didn't know what a barrack looked like. They had a wooden shack with the shelves, with wooden, with wooden shelves, the bunks, that's all. No mattress, no pillow, no nothing. Little blankets, yes, small blankets. It just separated us from the ladies, from the men, and they put us into the barracks, three men to a bunk. It was only maybe 50 inches wide. Three people had to stay in that bunk, sleep in that bank, bunk. And Kobe, each one had a little skinny little blanket. We rolled our own clothes up and made a pillow out of it so you wouldn't hit, lay on top of the board and cover yourself with the blanket. Very uncomfortable. There was no way you can get a good night's rest because if one turned, the next one had to turn. And we stayed there and worked in the factory. The next morning, after we slept over, they gave us roll call. In the morning, they started with the rations. A small piece of bread, two slices of toast you put together. It's about an inch thick, the same size as a piece of toast and black imitation coffee. That was our breakfast. Now, are you in a camp now where you're describing? Or the we're in the, they're already in the slave labor camp, so yeah. Now, I missed it. How did you get, you were taken into that camp? From the ghetto, okay. when after selection, they took away the old and very young and the handicapped. They left only the workforce. And they never took us back to the ghetto. We were march, had to march running actually, jogging, to the slave labor camp on top of a stone quarry. What was the name of this camp? They didn't have a name on it. Okay. It's in my own city, Starachowice in, in Poland, Poland yeah. yeah. And the German army, the Germans were, were watching the camp? And the Germans, and they also had the, 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 uh, the accomplices. They had the Ukrainians who were very mean, and some Lithuanians were very mean, who joined the Nazi regime. They became Nazis. They were our guards, some of them. And some of them, uh, one German and one Ukrainian, or vice versa. And sometimes all three were there. Now, how many m months were you in this slave labor camp? In the slave labor camp, I stayed from, uh, from October 42 until the end of 43. That's a long time. In what, that camp. What, what was, describe to me some of the more difficult times in that camp. Well, the difficult times is we were always hungry. We didn't get enough food. We were dirty, filthy. We had nowhere to wash. In the summer when it happened, we were washing from the waist on up. You rinse yourself off with no soap. Then it won't cut anybody's hair. Everybody got lice infested. Lice breeds typhoid. And then they had a killing unit that would come every day to the slave labor camp. It's in German called Einsatzgruppe. Translating, it's the killing unit. And if you didn't go to work that day when you came down with the typhoid, very contagious, and then one catches it from the other because we were staying in such a close quarters. So you catch it one from another. And the killing unit had a picnic. But before that, if I may back up, before they put us into the ghetto, they had us grab us in the streets once we had the uh, yellow patches on, the Star David. They grabbed us to go dig trenches in the outskirts of the town. And they told us the trenches were for tanks to fall in because the war was still going on. And we believed them. Six foot, four foot, I don't remember how deep we dug them. Dug till we were finished digging. Then we wound up in the ghetto. Then when we got to the slave labor camp and the epidemic, typhoid epidemic broke out, then the killing unit would take these people. You have to, when you kill someone, you have to set a place to bury them. There were no crematorium, crematoriums in those days yet. So they took them to the outskirts of the town and we were told that they shot him and into the ditch they went. We found out from the farmers after the war. The farmers got the clothes because you had to undress naked before they shoot you. And the farmers took the clothes and re-washed re them or whatever they did to them, recycled them, and then the person never made it back. I lost a sister that way. The other sister, she was the youngest of the girls. 
she died of typhoid during the night after a few days. She caught it and she was laying in a one room hospital, just a small bunk were there, two bunks, and she had nothing full of bed sores. And I, when I come from night shift, we had three shifts over there, seven to three, from three to 11, from 11 to seven. When I was from 11 to seven, before I went to sleep, to, after working all night, I still was going to her, check her out, see how she is, Ida. She was the youngest of the girls. How you doing? So she was showing me nothing but bed sores because she was laying on wood. There was no mattress, no straw, no nothing. She had a little blanket, but she was full of sores. So I took, brought her home some rags from the factory. Took, them, took a chance and took some home, the clean ones, not the ones that was wiping off the equipment. I tried to get some clean ones and put, so she can put it down on the bunk and rest on it. So she told me that helped her a little. And later on, when I checked on her a few, maybe a week later, she was not there anymore. I asked the Jewish policeman, which we had, I said, what happened to my sister? I used to check on her, where is she? She died during the night. We buried her in the bottom of the stone quarry. Now, why didn't they take her away to where they took the others? That I can't answer. But they said they buried her in the bottom of the stone quarry. So that's, she left already. And the other sister, the killing unit got, they took her away, I said, I waved at her, goodbye. Her name was Harriet, Chaya in Jewish. I don't have a picture of her. And um, I no longer saw her. So that was two. I had one more left, Faye, Faye. She was that time already transferred to another job. Instead of a munition factory, she became a tailor. But they had a lot of tailors working for the German uniforms or the SS, doing some extra work for them. They came in one time, a high-ranking officer, after three years being in that camp working a munition factory, told them to hurry on with the clothes because you're all going to be deported out of here. The tailors didn't like that. They said now they finally realize they're going to, they probably they're going to kill us because working for three years and helping them with the war machinery, where are they going to take us? They don't, uh, we performed, we did the work, not that we got so bad that we couldn't perform, we still performed. We worked with non-Jews, we had to do the same jobs they did. They had three meals a day, we only had the one in the morning and you came back at night, you had cabbage soup, you couldn't even find a leaf of cabbage in there, just plain water. So anyway, so they told the tailors, we are going to be deported. The tailors organized an escape out of this slave labor camp. The whole, no way a whole camp can disappear. What happened is, they organized whomever they can trust. My sister told me I was a brother. And the others mostly had relatives and, or cousins. And we, they all got a group together, I don't know how many, and they organized an escape. My sister didn't tell me about the escape just one night before, I think. I was that time already 15 years old. She says, we are going to run out of this place. When you get back from the factory from 3 to 11, when you get back at 11, do not go into the barrack to sleep. Wait for me outside. I'm going to come by and grab you. We're going to run out of here. I was looking forward to it. I would, to get out from this hell place at 15 years old, I want to be out free. So it happened, the pitch dark, the lights, she came along with the Jewish policeman. She, he held her hand. She grabbed my hand. All three were running. Other people were running too. Whoever cut the hole through, I don't know, one of the people that were organized to cut it. They were not electric wires. They were just plain barbed wires. And we were running. So I don't know whether we made a little bit too much noise. The German shepherd dogs are very alert dogs. They were growling. They were barking but on the top of the tower with the dogs, they knew something was wrong. They must have let the dogs run through, loose, and then they started putting the floodlights back on. They also had organized the partisans, you know what they are? Mm -hmm. Like a freedom fighter, mm -hmm. like the, the terrorists here trying to get us. The terrorists in the wooded area were against the Germans. They were blowing up rail, trains, and all that. They were supposed to came, come in and help us escape. The, the tailors knew somebody. And they were supposed to come and help us escape. So we made, made a little bit too much noise because he, she, the, my sister said, it's going to be pitch dark and I'll come and get you. Well, it got pitch dark because there was an air raid at the area and the uh, freedom fighters never showed up anyway. So we made a little bit, maybe too much noise. That's why the dog alerted the guards. He opened up the floodlights. 
from both towers, and it was roaming around the lights, running crazy from one place to the other. He found the spot. He found the spot and put automatic fire, side shooting. And I got hit in the back of my head with a bullet, not inside, otherwise I wouldn't be here. A bullet grazed me, but nevertheless, it knocked me out. as holding my sister by her hand. And I awoke and a few seconds later, I came back to myself. I didn't know where I was, I was disoriented. I was screaming for my, my sister, Fake. I, all I had left was her, I lost the rest of them, but they were, you know, the two I was sure to get killed, but the others, I don't know where they were. And I screamed there, high heaven, she didn't answer. I said, maybe she changed her mind, and she ran into the women's barrack. So I took a chance and I ran in there. I was full of blood all over me in the back. I ran in there, the woman in charge of the barrack says, you cannot come in here, you're gonna get us all killed because the Germans are gonna find you here, they're gonna kill all of us. I said, no, I'm not leaving, I'm sorry. He's shooting and I'm not going nowhere. And I put, lay down on the floor and I didn't go. In fact, they had to lay down on the floor themselves because they were so angry that we were trying to break out that they were shooting into the bad wooden shacks. You know, a bullet goes through wood. So instead of sitting on the bunks, they were all on the ground, including me. A, a cousin of mine saw me in there in the woman's back. She was my first cousin. Her mom and my mom were sisters. She was not aware of the escape. She cleaned me up with the blood. I told her what happened to me. And she gave me a rag and put it in the back of my head, my wound. She gave me a beret, I took off from her head, so I could put the beret on and hold it down so that it absorbed the blood. And I stubborn, I did not want to come out of there until almost daylight. By that time, the shooting subsided, no shooting. And I snuck out from the women's barrack and I ran in where I belonged, to my barrack. Two hours later, roll call. Everyone had to come out and leave the barracks, including the women and men. They started to count us to see how many did escape. They wanted to get some idea. As they were counting us, they told us to turn our faces over to where the hole was cut through. There, I looked and there was the Jewish policeman sitting in upright position with his uniform cap yet, with the armband, he had a white armband. And my sister next to him was lay flat. She was on the ground with the blonde hair. She didn't move, so I presume she was probably dead. But he took the uh, automatic weapon and he killed, we had a lot of wounded people there who didn't make it, they were just wounded. I'm sure with some help they could have lived. Instead, he took his machine weapon, the automatic weapon, he killed all the wounded people right in the front of us. And this, your lesson you learn, this is what will happen to you if you try to escape. And the rumor was true. Within about two weeks, they stuck us all on those freight cars and we were all deported. They stuck us into those cattle cars like animals. No water, no bathroom to go, no bucket for bathroom. I mean, a human being, you need a bathroom. You need some water. You send animals on a, on a trip, you send along water. They wouldn't give us anything. They sealed us up like, like we were nothing. And they did the, the, uh, the uh, destination was three days we traveled. And our destination on the way, we stopped in different stations because we were not the, the, uh, the priority transport. They let the army go through, they let the other trains go through. <clears throat> we were sort of less like slow boat to China. They didn't care if we die or not, but they care. So we finally arrived, so we stopped at stations and we were screaming in unison, water, water, we didn't ask for food, just water, they wouldn't give us anything, they wouldn't open up the cars. We finally, our destination happened to be Auschwitz, where the famous sign, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free. Like hell it did, they more, more kill you, they kill you. We got there and the trains opened up and they started screaming, arouse, aus, everybody fast. We had two guys standing by the wagon, each one with their dog, and they told you which way you go. You come off, left, right, left, right. We had three dead people in my car. I don't know how long they were dead. They were stinched to high heaven. You couldn't even breathe in that car. But luckily, that window was there with the barbed wire on it. A little bit fresh, but nobody, some people got stubborn and didn't want to move away from it. We had fights in the car too, a little bit. So anyway, half of our transport as we came off in Birkenau Auschwitz at the platform, half of our transport was went straight through crematorium. We found that out the next day. They either had an order how many they need to kill that day, or maybe they didn't have the room for 
that many that came that day. So half of them didn't make it. We found out the next day from people who were there before us. We got our news, a lot of news from the people who push cart around, the push carts that pick up dead bodies, people like drop dead themselves from, from, from exhaustion, from hunger. So these people went straight up to them, they're already in heaven, you were lucky. We were all lucky, we went over to the good side, and we all got numbers on our arm. Should I show you the number? I will show you, but if you want to take a picture of it, there it is. This, this, this was the arm that we got the number on. Hold on, just hold still right there for a second. Okay. Okay, turn your arm a little more towards the camera, the other way. No, oh, this way? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold on, Tracy. I'll probably take a shot later too, but just hold okay. on for a second. Okay, I'll probably take another shot later. Okay. Too. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so anyway, so they gave us the numbers. Now, you didn't have anything left with you when you came there. All you had was clothes on and, and, your, uh, and your, yourself. They made sure they took away your name from you. All you became is a number. Yeah. They addressed you only by number. Amongst each other, we called each other by name, of course. But the roll call or they get that little piece of bread you were only a number. Mm -hmm. I keep still looking at her. <laughs> okay. You're, you're, at least you know you're doing it. So you're doing great. Henry. Okay. Go ahead. And so now, the, now the second stop was finally a haircut. After three some years, women and the men, we didn't get a haircut. Even though we were so lice infested, mm -hmm. they still didn't give us a haircut till we got to Auschwitz, Birkenau. We got a haircut finally. The barber sitting by the chairs, there were two, I think, I had one of them, questioned me about my wound that I had. I had a gash, like three inch gash in the back of my head. What is this? Was he, did you get shot? I, didn't, I was afraid. I didn't know who he was. Was he Jewish? Was he German? Or oh, I, I can't divulge to him, hey, I tried to escape and, and, uh, and, and I got shot. He would have probably killed me or reported me, so I didn't want to say nothing. I told him we had a fight in the car, in the cattle car. He didn't ask me no more questions. I found out he was Jewish anyway the next day. Our third stop, finally, shower. Now, not to have a shower for three years. You know how it felt to see shower. You want to wash. It's lice infested. We finally got into the shower, and they gave us soap. We had water coming. I, I think it was warm water. I'm not 100% sure. I think it was warm water. And we cleaned up real good. Scrubbed ourselves really to almost take the skin off to, to start using the soap especially the head, and my wound was infected already, getting infected in there, but the water and the soap helped at cleaning it off, but I got infected later on anyway. And then they furnished us on the way out with a three-piece outfit, mm -hmm. because when we came there, we did not wear striped uniforms. We wore whatever you had, the clothes that you had all day, that's what you wore, that's where you went to sleep in, the same clothes. But there they gave us finally a three-piece outfit, the striped uh, hat, striped jacket, striped pants, and the shoes, wooden shoes with canvas tops, no underwear, no socks. And finally, they, we came out there, Keith, they felt very good, you were still hungry though, but at least you were not eaten up by the lice anymore, you, you at least left that alone. And we assigned us to a barrack. In the same barrack, it didn't change, the same bunks, 50 inches maybe wide, three people to a bunk, Sure, they did that with the women too. And um, our food was, like I said, was just a piece of bread. That didn't change. The coffee, the irritation, Erzat's coffee. And we had this, the uh, cabbage soup in the evening. Well, nothing but water. The first night we spent in that barrack, we had screams next to the barrack to us. We didn't know what it was. I mean, I never had screams like that before. I was still only 15 years old. I was frightened to death. I lost all my family. I lost my, my dear sister, which was like my mother to me at the end. I looked up to her. She would give her bread sometime away to give it to me. And then, uh, uh, I lost myself already. Are you talking and, about uh, the screams? Yeah, I know. So anyway, so I, I missed her so much. And I, then all of a sudden, we sleep in there. And I see all these screams, hear all these screams. We didn't know till the next morning what those screams were. There was a, a barrack with gypsies, and they didn't like there was gypsy night. All the gypsies were killed, and I don't know how they did it. They must have dragged them out there, and they probably put on a fight. They didn't want to leave. They took them over to the crematorium. I don't know how they did that. I don't know. All I know it was quiet the next morning, and we got that same news 
broadcast from these push card guys. We used to get, they've been there six months already. We had just arrived. So they told us there was gypsy night and they all burnt up already. Luckily, I only stayed in this Auschwitz-Birkenau three, by three months, I think. A German man, dressed man, came in, civilian. Evidently, he was looking for free labor. He ordered everyone out of the barrack that we were in because the people that were there before us already looked a little bit more skeleton already. We just arrived. It was not as good a food day as we had before. We didn't look skeleton. We looked like we can do some work yet. He came in and ordered us out of the barrack, and he checked you over. Whoever he liked, he called you over to him. Now, what was for, we didn't know. Maybe taking us to get us killed, we didn't know. But luckily, as many as he picked that time, I don't know how many, 50. I'll just give you a rough number. I don't know. I'm not sure. And he marched us out of the... I still don't know whether he marched us out of uh, Auschwitz or he put us in a little pickup truck. That I can't remember. But the camp, the camp was very close. It was a subcamp of Auschwitz called B-U-N-A, Buna, Manowitz. It was a subcamp of Auschwitz. There was a little bit cleaner, believe it or not. They still smelled the stench from the burning by a flash that was all over there, but not as much as in Auschwitz itself. It was a little further away. There was a lot of hangings and shooting, yes, in our, in our Buna Manowitz. Now, that man happened to be, we found out, an owner or a manager of a chemical company called I.G. Farben, F-A-R-B-I-N or E-N. They're still in existence now. They're involved with aspirin, was involved there with them too. They were looking for free labor. They're the, they're the ones that produce the cyclone gas and all other chemicals, box sprays, rubber tires. They did a lot of stuff in there. We were chosen for that factory to build the road the, on the compound of the factory with the cobblestones. Not only did we have to build the road, but we also had to unload the cars. The, the freight cars came. And the freight cars came with sand, gravel, and the stones and they came with cement bags. Put two people to a car, and they only gave you a certain time to have it unloaded, and you better have it unloaded. The cement was the worst. I shouldn't say it's just the worst, because the others had blisters from it. But the cement, you walked up, and there were two people picking up a bag of cement and throwing it on your shoulder. You were so weak that your knees buckled when they put the bag of sho over your shoulder. Whether it was 25 or 50 pounds, I'm not sure. But all I know, he made us run to put it in the area where they want us to put it. Look, they would not allow it us to just normally, like a normal person, to walk over there with it. We had to run. And you had extra curriculum on, on, your, on your shoulder. It's heavy. And they were standing with whips and hitting you under your legs and the dogs. So we had to do that. Unloading the others, the two people to a car. In the beginning, it's easy. You shovel it out the sand into the wheelbarrow, the guy that's in charge of the wheelbarrow, <clears throat> excuse me, he takes it away. But once you work yourself inside to the cars, it's a little harder. That means shovel to shovel. You got to go in the back and take a shovel and do it. So you all but had blisters on our hands because we didn't have much meat on our hands, just skins and bones, but we had all, no gloves. We had all blistered. Anyway, we stayed in this IG farm and company to almost the end of 43, it was almost 44, the United States got into the war already at that time, and they started the bomb IG factory, the rail leading into it. So they couldn't get any supplies out or in. So they had us like isolated. Now they were working there, none, most a lot, so were big factories, a lot of non-Jews working there. We also were there with eight or 10 British war prisoners were there, POWs. But they looked like they were well treated. The shoes were shined, they had their uniforms on, they had their little oversea cap tucked underneath the shoulder here. They really looked like they're not mistreated. They did easy work. They picked up little dirt from the girl with a little stick they used to, or a little pickup thing, paper or something. They would pick it up on their little wheelbarrow. But we got a lot of help from those soldiers. They told us to stick to it, don't give up, you'll make it, you'll make it. And these are United States Air Forces, that's who's bombing here. And they would not allow us into the bunker or the 
British guards, they were not allowed into the bunker either. The only one who go in the bunker is the German guards and the non-Jewish people that worked there. They had a bunker. Why they were running into the bunkers, uh, one of our bunk mates said, why don't I go scavenge around for food? Because the guards are not there and the other people are in there. Let me go look for food. He brought us back some food. He found the kitchen and he never went inside the kitchen, just outside, whatever they were throwing it out for trash. And trust me, when you're hungry, you'll eat anything. No such a thing, it's going to be mildew, or it doesn't stale, or it doesn't smell good. You'll eat it, trust me. When you get to the point, you'll eat anything. This boy, that young boy, did it about three times. We, at the end, we started warning him not to do it. It got too good for him. He brought us back a lot of stuff from whatever they threw out, and he got caught. He got caught one day. And one day, there I look on a Sunday, they hung four people in Buna Manowitz. He was amongst the four. I knew what he did, committed just to take trash that you throw away. For this, you, 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 you punish the person to hang him. I don't know what the other three were charged with that. I don't know. Inmates. I don't know what they were charged with. But we saw that boy hung up there and we broke our hearts. And we tried to warn him, but he didn't listen. They were killers, murderers. They didn't care. And we stayed in there until the bombing really got real heavy. They even had special... Uh, drums that had uh, like 75 uh, uh, containers, 75 uh, gallons, and they would open up, unscrew a little uh, uh, nozzle or something, and smoke would filter in through the whole factory. You could not see the sky out. But the, it didn't stop the United States Air Force from bombing anyway. They still threw the bombs down. So I got so bombed, we had to go ahead and evacuate us. So they took us on the trains again, on the cattle cars, again, we went on a trip, unknown where. We were traveling for days and days. We didn't know where we were going. On the way, we were bombed. Sometimes we had to even, they made us leave the train and to hit the wooded area with the dogs loose. We couldn't go too far. And then we went back on when they finished bombing. Sometimes we had to walk to another town next to it to get another train because this, if they couldn't fix the damaged part, we had to change over to another one. But we were heading to a camp called Flossenburg, and that was near the Czechoslovakian border, six kilometers from the Czech border. And the name was Flossenburg. We finally got there, mostly uh, riding, and then partially on foot when we walked in there. It was just like another camp. There was no work for us to do over there. Or we, we got a shower that, that, that when we arrived. And then the work that we did there was a heap of clothes from people that they were murdered two stories high, land, and they made us go up there to the, to the pile and started uh, packaging up, bundled up clothes, coats with coats, uh, pants with pants, or whatever, glasses, brushes, whatever it was. They were resending it into Germany, recycling it. And we stayed in there in Flossenburg, maybe a few months we stayed in there, and we heard later that the Russians came from the east and they attacked coming the way Flossenburg was, near the Czech border, I guess that's east. And then we didn't know who they were because we heard a lot of noise. We heard the heavy artillery guns pounding, woof, woof, heavier and closer and closer. We thought, well, we were happy because we thought somebody's going to get us maybe. But why would the Germans be here so close? But eventually the man in charge of our barrack gave himself away. He says, don't be so happy. Before the Russians get here, we're going to kill all of you here. See, so he gave away. He said, Russians, we were happy then. We said, the Russians are coming. They're going to maybe free us. But it so happened that they evacuated us out of Flossenburg again before the Russians got there. Put us on the trains again. This time we went in deeper into Germany. Or Bavaria, Germany, or traveled to Austria, Czechoslovakia. And we, were no, we didn't know where we were going. We were bombarded on the way, yes, a few times from the Air Force, the United States Air Force. And at the end, it was already 45 that time. And at the end, at the end, we only could march. February, March, and April of 1945. Strictly marching. They gave up the trains because the United States Air Force didn't let them move. So we wound up marching. And the marching took its toll on us. The, the, we, the survivors, named it the Death March. We were marching, we were dying as we were marching. 
The reason is you didn't get that little piece of bread in the morning. You didn't get that soup in night. You didn't get the coffee in the morning. You got nothing. So you had to eat greenery from the leaves, whatever you stood in the wooded area, chew it. But like I said before, you'll eat anything when you're hungry. And then now and then if the God was hungry and he saw the dogs need to be fed, he found a palm, went into the farm, and they went into the kitchen in the farmer's house and had himself a good meal. All we were allowed is one raw potato and some water. And if we came in day, we had to get the potato and the water. We had to wait till those two guys with their dogs are well fed, stayed in there, you know, till they come out and we marched again. If we came in later in the evening, they didn't want to march us in the evening. So they put us up into the silo where the hay is. Got our raw potato into the clothes that locked us into the, for us, this was just like a hotel. You were at least, you were at least undercover, and the hay, it's so warm in there, you sleep on very soft stuff. We would take our clothes out, clothes off, and we'd wring it out, lay it out, and so it would dry by morning. Sometimes it would dry, sometimes it didn't, but it helped a little. But we were so hungry, we were chewing hay. You can't swallow it, you'll choke, but we were chewing it to get the juice out of it. Just spit it back out. And in the morning, we got our potato, march again. So one day before liberation, before the 25th of April, 1945, we slept over at the farm in the silo overnight. And then in the morning, we only got our potato and the water, and we marched for only two hours into a wooded area. We came into this wooded area, and we were not too far from a, uh, a highway. And on the highway, we saw a lot of tanks, artillery pieces, jeeps. We didn't know who they were. Were they Germans? Were they Americans? Were they, were they British? Or was it Russian? We didn't know who they were. So we were just watching it. They were just heavy stuff came through there. Then we sitting there looking over, which is all we had to do. All of a sudden, we see our two guards with the dogs took off and ran away from us. They could have killed us, which they did on the 29th to another group. We were spared. They took off and ran away. We had a lesson to learn from the previous uh, camp that we were still in our city. He killed all the wounded ones. And right there he said, if you'll escape, that's what will happen to you. So we could, after the guards disappeared, we could have run away. But we didn't want to do it. We were afraid. We stayed in the same area that he told us to stay until a tank takes off from the main highway came about five feet from us, and there goes a beautiful soldier slipping out of his hatch, like a genie out of a bottle, cut himself out. And all we could see is Kukat hair. And America, America written here, he told us we were free. But we were skeletons that time already. I weighed 75 pounds at liberation. I was 17 years old already at 75 pounds, so you could imagine what we looked like. He yelled over to his partner in the tank, whatever rations he had, he dumped them out. But I never got to it. We were fighting like cats and dogs. We couldn't get one. So he saw we were going to hurt ourselves. He said, follow me behind my tank. Not on the side, but behind me, just mainly by sign language. Stay here and take you across the street. There, plenty of you there liberated, and you got lots of food. Well, we did that. It looked forever. It was only maybe a short little distance till we got over the highway and into the farm we went. And right in the front of the farmer, he had mixed up three pails of potato peelings with white flour on it, in it. And to us, when you're hungry, that looked mighty appetizing. And we, got, we had to clean those trays off first. The poor soldiers had to pull us in by the clothes. The other one had the door open to the farmer, just sign language to go in. We did not believe it was going to be food in there. We had to get this first, get rid of this. And you didn't, by that time, I was already full. After I had a pretty good portion of it. And I finally made it to the door. I could not believe it. Why did we eat this, all this junk? Why well, I call it junk then. But it looked, when you were eating, it looked like a steak. Well, you were so hungry. And then we looked inside. Some of us were there. Some liberated already. And they had food on the table. Big breads that the farmers bake. They had fruit. They had boiled potatoes. And instead of raw potatoes they gave us before, they had eggs, hard-boiled eggs. They had all kinds of vegetables laying there. We could not believe it. Why did we eat this? But guess what? All of those people were sick as a dog. The need for four or five years, all of a sudden, 
all the goodies you get to eat, they all got sick. And I named my liberator my angel, because I don't know his name. So my angel went and had to call up for reinforcement. He called up reinforcement, he called in the medics. They came, of course we were already that time in human being hands, not these animals. And they gave each one pills, medication to take. With sign language I walked over to one and showed them my two or three inch cash, whatever I had in the back. Can you, with, in fact, he could have seen it, he saw it, and he pointed out, says, all right, okay, something new, sign language. And he cleaned it up, he shaved it a little bit, cleaned it up, put medication on it, put it on with a Band-Aid. Three months later, I was healed up. I was in a human being's hand instead of those animals. And I was liberated April the 25th, 1945. At the age of 17, I weighed 75 pounds. Did you have... When did you grieve for your sisters? When they were killed or afterwards? I mean, No, not until I got back on my feet. And not until I started not wanting any food constantly on my mind. Before you got to a point, all of the on your mind is food. Food, food, food. Once we got enough food in our belly, and we were already that time, and like I was working for the American Kitchen, I got, they took us in, they took three boys, three, when we were settled in that city, they took in three Jewish boys and three Belarusi boys. They gave us jobs in the kitchen. We didn't have to peel potatoes, no. We didn't do anything. We just hand out the food to the soldiers. The mass sergeant, we didn't have gloves in those days, made sure that we scrubbed our hands real clean. And we were handing out the food to the American soldiers. And they made us stay with them in the buildings. We had bunks, but the bunks were soft. You sleep, you had blankets. You were warm in there. It was nice. They treated us like kings. And they had, they had food there that I didn't even have at home. I mean, they had bananas. They had, they had uh, oranges. They had all kind of goodies. And it didn't much time. To, to build yourself up. And once I built myself up, then we started saying, maybe we're going to look for our relatives. Maybe they took away the two sisters in the beginning with their little kids. Maybe they killed the kids. Maybe the girls went, they took them to go to work. They were young enough in their 20s, late 20s. I mean, that's young. Each one, one of them had two boys, the other one had two little girls. And Faye gave up her little girl because she was working in the factory to go with grandma. So they were all young, and I said, well, I knew Fager was dead, and I knew my other three sisters, that were, my other two that I was with, that they didn't make it, but I was thinking about the other two, but there was not. We went to a, a camp called, we rode the train ferry. So we went to a camp called Bergen-Belsen, because mostly I think there was women, and we said, maybe I can find my sisters there, but I didn't find them there. I found my cousin, the one who helped me with the bleeding when I first got shot, who went into the women's barrack. She says, oh, she was so glad to see me. I was glad to see her. She didn't try to escape. She made it. And she says, I am leaving for Poland next week. Do you want to go with me? She's going to look for her brother. There was a displaced person camp in Poland, Lutsch, Poland. A displaced person camp. And she wanted to go see if her brother was in, in Russia, in Siberia somewhere. So he, she thought that he was there in Poland. She went to Poland. I didn't want to go with her. I went back to an American site, but the British, the British liberated Bergen-Belsen. I didn't even want to stay there. I was afraid. I had a sister in America who came here in 1937. So that was on my mind. I said, if I'm with the British, I may have trouble getting to the United States. So I wanted to be with the, Briti with the American soldiers. So I was glad to leave there. She went to Poland. She met her brother, and she ran across my brother, the one who was in the Polish army. And she told him that I was alive and I am in near Frankfurt, Germany, in a displaced person camp there, UNRWA. I showed you the picture of it. And within two weeks, he came. Now, one little story that I didn't tell you was when we were on the farm. When we were on the farm, my oldest brother, he was supposed to be the uh, breadwinner. After my father died, he's the tailor shop. He was out in the farm with me, and me and him were eating tomatoes and one bread and a piece of bread in the other hand. My breakfast. The Germans were not there yet. And, and the uh, Polish soldier came running through. And he says, my, so my brother stopped him. Where are you running from? He says, the Germans are here, three kilometers here. They're coming this way. So the soldier said, uh, my brother says to the soldier, can I run away with you? He said, yeah, sure. So he took off with the soldier. I'm his little brother. And I'm chasing for two, two miles with him. And he keeps saying, go back, go back to your mother, go back. Eventually, 
I had to listen and go back to my mother. I didn't know where he was. When it got really hard, we've just got a few minutes, Henry. I got a couple questions. Okay. When it got real difficult during your time in Auschwitz and the whole time, did you pray to God? I prayed every day. Every day, dear Lord, save me. Save me so I can tell my sister in America what happened to her family. I did that all the time. But I did complain after liberation when that angel freed me. I said, dear Lord, thank you. But why did it take you so long? I did say that. How has all this cha affected you after the war, even today when you sit down and eat? You're, 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 you're thankful for everything you have, aren't you? I am thankful for everything I have. I used to watch my children wasting food. I didn't like that. I used to tell them, don't waste it because people died over this. You know, I was maybe too strict with them with the food. It's, but now, now, normally, you know, in America, you, food is plentiful. Yeah. Yeah, t tell, tell me why it's important that our country remembers these things, because some people are denying it happened, but why should our country remember what happened? Because of those deniers. We want the world stood by and let it happen. Everybody didn't know it happened. They say they didn't. They did know, but no one came to help us. We felt like we were abandoned, especially on the death march when we were marching. No one could see us. No one would hear us. So we would always talk to God, help, 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 help. And that's why we have to talk. We have to tell what happened, why we're still alive, to tell the kids or school teachers or anyone wants to listen. Maybe it pre will prevent it from happening again. You can't just let them hell, though people are still fighting, still killing each other. And until the world gets started to get along with one another and treat each other the right way, we all God's children. Then it, then it won't happen. So we're going to talk until we are getting old enough not be able to talk, until I'm silent. Then they'll have to put up with the our beautiful institution, the museum. Very educational there. So those deniers will not get away with it. What does freedom mean to you? Freedom means everything. Freedom is God's truth. Freedom is well, the best thing in the world. When you have freedom, when they take freedom away from you, you have nothing. You have nothing. You've got to fight for your freedom. Speak out to make sure that freedom never is taken away from you. What do you feel when you walk to the Holocaust Museum or the first time you saw it? What, what do you feel? I was feeling bad. I went through it. I started rehashing everything. You know, I don't go up there too much. I can tolerate most of it. But somehow the shoes. The shoes, when I walk through the shoes, I get goosebumps. For the shoes, I keep looking at little baby shoes, their high heel shoes, their work shoes, all kind of thing. How do I know? Maybe it's one of my, my family's shoes in there. How do I know? And the smell of it, I just don't try to avoid that one. I don't go through there too much. But the other stuff I look through, I mean, you know, I, I can tolerate it. Just tell me briefly, you don't have to get really descriptive, but you, you mentioned the smells of the burning flesh. So... They had ovens where they threw bodies in? Yes, the crematorium. The bodies were dead, yes. The crematorium. They had more bodies outside the crematorium than they can burn. So the bodies were lined up in the front of the crematorium like, like a, uh, like a, a um, lumber yard with wood. And they, they were inhumane people, inhumane people. And now you see these people were only... a. Uh, uh, maybe a half a mile away from the crematoriums. They showed in the Washington Post, I think, there's pictures where these German women and men, they're dancing and they're happy or lucky. And they're, they're burning people, innocent people, babies. How do, you kill, how do you kill a child? And I can never get over that. Being that I'm a grandfather and I saw my little kitties, and I said, oh my God, how do you kill a child, innocent child? What did this child do to you? So the world must learn about all this, and maybe it won't happen again. It's happening in, uh, in Darfur, Sudanese, you have, but at least people speak out on it. We talk about it, we help them. And in my case, where we were, the Jews, no one helped. Until the United States finally got into the war, they went into the war to defeat Nazis. They didn't go into the war to free us, but why they were coming through their camps, they run across the, the camps, and the soldiers did not believe what they saw. They had to call the, 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 the what do you call, the high-ranking officers, the officers or the sergeants 
Are these people human or is this from another world? They couldn't recognize that a human being would look like that. And that's what we need to prevent it from happening again. So you're saying when you were liberated, these liberators couldn't believe it. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. I've talked to a lot. And, of them. Usually with us too, but, but the shows where they got into camps, when they liberated a camp, and you see these people coming out of the barracks. With me, I was already on the road, you know, I was out. But these people didn't, they could hardly walk. I mean, they saw the army, there, some of them would die right there. They died in their hands, some of them. And I guess there's no answer to the question why God let this happen. There's no answer, is there? I have no answer for it, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't have an answer. The only thing I am puzzled by is why the world stood by and let it happen, and let that crazy man, Adolf Hitler, I hate to use his name even, get away with all this, country to country, country to country, no one stopped him. You mean America, British, French, Russia? They couldn't pile up on him and say, hey, you don't do that, we're gonna get you. He wouldn't fight all these countries, no way. But they let him get away with it. They went to Austria, nobody said anything. They went to Poland, nobody said anything. So, well, they're free to go where they want. They could have come here too. So we'll have to stop it someday, not let these things get away with it. And there might be in the works some maniac crazy man that wants to do that again. Who knows? Is this a part of you every day or is this something that happened 60 years ago? No, I always think about it. I always think about it. I never, my family, I always look, especially you go to sleep. You start, sometimes you can't fall asleep because when you get that on your mind, my, my, my relatives, my sisters, you start thinking, what would it be if they would be in this country? They look at how many uh, nieces and nephews I would have had and all that, different families. But of course, they took all that away from us. I always think about it every day, every day. It'll never leave you, will it? No, I don't think so, no. At least we speak out on it. I think I get it out of my system a little bit. But still, I guarantee I'll, I'll dream plenty tonight. Yeah. I, I thank you because, you know, I think the, the educational value of what we're hearing and what I'll be documenting is very valuable for... I go into schools a lot. I talk to kids and at some point I'll bring this into the school. We do too. And we'll, yeah. We go to middle school, we go to public school. And the teachers. So you're doing good. First-hand account, this is the way it needs Good. to be. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.